Okay, a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming early and welcome to today's lecture titled The Abyssidarian Approach by Professor Joseph Sparling. Um, so, my name is Daryl, I'm from the Early Childhood Development Agency and today's uh, lecture is actually jointly organised by the S.R. Nadin School of Human Development of the Singapore University of Social Services as well as the Early Childhood Development uh, Agency. Uh, so just a quick note before we start, uh, there will be photos and videos taken during this lecture. Uh, they'll be used for publicity and training purposes. Okay? Okay, so a quick introduction to today's lecture. Um, the Abyssidarian approach integrates the basic principles of human learning and development into a fun way uh, to promote early learning and foster stable relationships between children and their caregivers. Several research studies have shown that this targeted educational support results in long-lasting improvements in the school and life achievements of at-risk and vulnerable children. And for today, we are very privileged to have with us Professor Joseph Sparling, um, who is the co-founder of the Abyssidarian Approach. Professor Sparling is also the Senior Scientist Emeritus at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina, as well as an honorary professorial fellow at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne, and director of the Abyssidarian Approach Australia project. Uh, we also have with us Kimberly Moenia, <laughs> who is our master trainer for the Abyssidarian Approach. Okay, so before we invite uh, Professor Sparling on stage, I would first like to invite uh, Ms. Se Yang Hee, um, who is the Director of the Child Development Department at EGDA, uh, to say a few words. So, Yang Hee, please. Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon to everyone here. Um, very, very glad uh, to know the very warm response that, uh, um, you know, that I see here today to Professor uh, Joseph Sparling's lecture on the Abyssidarian Approach. And uh, it's always wonderful to see uh, you know, different people from different sectors, different work areas coming together with interest in the same subject. And uh, today we have with us uh, early childhood professionals and leaders, um, academics, uh, partners and colleagues from social service, uh, from the community, uh, from the health sector and uh, various other government sectors. Uh, I believe we're here uh, today because we are all passionate about improving the lives um, and the quality of child development um, in our various uh, areas of work um, so that children can uh, receive the best start in life. And um, the government recognises the importance of the early years uh, in a child's life and in shaping his or her future. And uh, that's why the government has progressively invested um, more and more in the uh, early childhood sector. And um, in 2016, ACDA initiated the Kids Start pilot to provide holistic support uh, for the development of children from low-income families. The Abyssidarian approach is one of the evidence-based uh, programs that we use in Kids Start. And uh, as you will hear from the professor later, it emphasizes the use of language as well as uh, enriched and responsive uh, adult-child interactions. Um, <coughs> And as we will learn later, the research uh, shows strong evidence of long-lasting impact um, of the Abyssidarian approach, especially for children from low-resource families. And um, uh, it's been implemented across different settings uh, in different countries and delivered through uh, different prof uh, practitioners and professionals alike. Uh, within Kids Start, we're using the Abyssidarian approach in our home visitation program. Uh, and our supported play groups where our kids start workers and facilitators um, work with parents to apply the approach when they interact with their children. And as announced in the media yesterday, ACDA is partnering 16 preschools um, to start using the Abyssidarian approach in the preschool classroom. And uh, we are encouraged by early feedback and observations uh, from practitioners and parents as they see positive impact from the children. So it is our privilege to have with us uh, Professor Sparling uh, here this week in Singapore and here today um, to share the Abyssidarian approach to a larger audience. Um, and I would like to thank SUSS especially for your support in organizing and hosting today's event. 
Um, and of course, we look forward to future collaboration with SUSS, with actually many partners here um, to grow capabilities in the, in the early childhood sector. So it is my pleasure to invite the professor on stage to um, deliver his lecture. And I wish you all a good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's just wonderful to be here in Singapore and to be here at SUSS. And uh, some of your faculty have visited me in, at my university, so it's, uh, it's, this feels like we already have a connection. And I thank uh, Hector for inviting uh, Kimberly Mounier and, and I to come here and to interact with you as you start this journey using uh, one of the most researched programs in the world. Um, let me see if I can get up on stage without falling down. Um, but we also need, I think, to darken the slide area if somebody can take care of that. Whoever is in control of the lights. I just know that the slides will be clearer for you if you get rid of these. Does that put me in the dark? <laughs> You've seen me, you, if you can just hear me. <laughs> you have to see what I'm doing every moment. Um, this gives my two university affiliations here, uh, but you certainly know that, uh, that as old as I look, I'm a retired person. In fact, I've been retired for 28 years, so that's pro probably longer than some of you have been alive. <laughs> just means that life doesn't stop at any particular pre predetermined time and you can, if you get a hold of a good topic, you can stick with it for a really long time. I actually began working on the Atmospheric Approach in 1967, which is a really quite a long time ago, and we started researching it in 1972. Let me see. I'm not, I'm, I'm advancing it. I'm not, Oh, here's the word abecedarian taken out of, out of um, the dictionary. Some people don't really believe it's a real word, but it is a true word in, in English and in quite a number of other languages as well. And it means someone who is learning the rudiments. We, we chose this word to be very distinctive. Maybe we were too clever. I have a really good relationship with staff and the home visitor. Here's a parent so talking. So when I talk to the staff, they let me know what kind of learning games they're doing with my children. And as well as they have offered like Absterian program outside of daycare. And it gives all the parents who attend like in-depth in information about Absterian. And we practice games with each other as well. So we can use those tools. All the games that are natural is just I wouldn't know all the games. There's like over 200 games. However, like they're all natural. It's just like you really need to have conversation and talk with your children. But when you have a conversation with um, your primary staff, they let you know what game they're working on. So they could staff could work with them at daycare, and then you could like work it with them at home. What I like best about Absterian is the, the children's vocabulary um, that they could talk. I have a lot of friends and people that I don't know, but I do know. Um, children are the same ages, and I'm saying like they're four or five years old, and they don't talk anything like compared to my children. And I totally believe that Absterian has a major part in my children's vocabulary. Notice one thing: how easily she says the word Absterian. <laughs> she, she's gotten used to it, even though it's a big word. You know, once you get over the, your fright <laughs> from saying the word, it's very comfortable. Now, this is a center in Can in Canada. Uh, where the, and they had the idea that they were going to film, they were having such good results, they were going to film some of their parents talking into the camera and some of their teachers. And I think it's a wonderful idea because, you know, there are data, I'm going to show you lots and lots of numbers today, but number, there are pe real people behind those numbers, you know, so it's good to have people talk directly to you. And, and these parents uh, agreed to, uh, to talk. And so, and to let other people know how they feel about it. So, um, the Abyssinian approach is, is a part of general approach to 
early childhood, but it is, it is unique, and it does get some unique results. So let me give you uh, a very brief look at what it is. It's a program that can be used across many different types of services, many different service delivery modalities, and that's rather unique about it. Many of the research programs can only be used in home visiting or only in child care or only in play groups, but this one cuts across all those, and that's one, one really good use that Singapore is making of the flexibility of this program. It's the essence of Abysterian is in fact the quality of the adult-child interaction. And you'll, you'll hear me come back to that quite a number of times today. And the, the term that you've probably all heard of because of the Harvard Center for the Developing Child uh, has really popularized it. It's called serve and return. But serve and return is a big summation of many different ideas about how we interact with children and uh, to make serve and return really frequent and really uh, implemented and present in all of, a, all of the child's day, we have in fact operationalized it. Now, by the way, serve and return didn't exist as a term, as an idea when we first started doing this, so we were retrofitting those two ideas back together. So let's go ahead and look at the various four big contexts in which uh, Abyssidarian takes place. The first one is simply through spontaneous events. You all know about teaching on the wing, te te the teachable moment when something happens. Uh, this is one of the things that we encourage people to do is to look for those moments that are totally unplanned, you cannot predict them, but something happens that you can you can make some mileage for, out of. And we use a, a an idea called Notice, Nudge, Narrate, the three ends, to guide people's thinking about how am I going to interact with that child. I'm not going to explain those. That's what you get if you go through training with Kimberly. <clears throat> then this is a second big area, and that is during caregiving. And we call it enriched caregiving if you do it the way that we encourage in Abyssidarian. Um, the Abyssinian approach guides the adult to attend to multiple opportunities of caregiving, and we think of just the care event, and we think of connection, which means the warm emotional contact between you and the child, and then content. That is, you talk about something during during your caregiving. It's not just um, you're not just in silence, or you're not just um, talking uh, randomly. You have an idea. I'm going to talk about shapes during this time, or I'm going to talk about colors, or and I'm going to talk about emotions during this particular caregiving event. And that makes it quite different from the way caregiving is done as a rule in child care. And then book reading is another area that we make this kind of serve and return interaction happen. And book reading we call actually uh, conversational reading. You see my, my labels up here. These are the Abyssinian labels. And book reading helps you use a hierarchical system of questioning so you're going to get responses from the child. See, show, say. Those are responses. Does the child see the picture you're talking about? When you ask, does the child show you that picture? And then when you ask further, does he say the name of the picture? Now, I was meeting with this morning with BPM uh, Thurman and he was uh, sitting with me and we role played a, a little bit for conversational reading and I was saying one of the things that we don't get trained as as much as in early childhood people as early childhood people is that the conversation between you and the child may not have any words at all from the child's point of view if the child is three months old or four months old he's not going to talk to you he's probably not even going to touch the book but you can open the book and see where his eyes are going you say huh you saw the ball. In other words, you are saying to yourself and you're saying to the child, you've made a response to me. I showed you a page and you chose something to look at. So you as an Abyssinian teacher are learning that you can accept responses that are very, very baby steps toward language. That is a step toward language. The child is doing something with his eyes, something is happening in his brain, and you are making it a meaningful event and surrounding it with language 
when you go on later on and say, you open the book and you say, oh, can you touch the ball? And the child does it, you, you, you can say, oh, yes, you touch the ball. Now you see, you, you use the word a bunch of times there, just in that little, little bit of time. But you've chosen it on what the child's attention is directed to. You're not trying to change his attention. Later on, we do, in fact, try to have the child move his attention to where ours is. But that's the way we begin. This is a very different kind of reading, and it is reading that is done individually with children. Many of you will think in your heads, there's no way I can read individually with the children in my classroom. But um, later on, I'll challenge you a little bit to think about that as a possibility. <clears throat> Oops, wait a minute, I jumped ahead. Now, the, last, the last situation we use Abyssinarian is with purposeful games. And we do games, and you heard that parent say there are 200 games that you get as a kind of a starter kit. Uh, and you will, as teachers, uh, invent new games. Uh, you use that to sustain play so the child gradually learns to think ahead and to be purposeful and to solve problems. So the Abyssinian approach, briefly, is a set of four elements for, the, for adult child interactions, and it's not specifically a curriculum, though some people use it totally as a curriculum. It can be used in the context of any curriculum that, that you're already using. So that's one thing I really want, if you're interested in, could I, could I possibly use this? I'm already doing X curriculum. The answer is yes, you can marry the two and you can insert Abyssinarian within it. And Abyssinarian, uh, I've learned from my colleagues, is really the, the how you do things. It's not the what you do, it's, it's how you do it. Okay, this is my visual picture of those four elements that I just talked to you about. The first one is language priority, and I think of that as a big red circle conceptually, and then there's conversational reading, and there's enriched caregiving, and there are learning games. And the, all, of, all of these things at the top are different ways of doing language priority. The reason we have language as the center, the biggest emphasis in our program is that this program is originally designed for children who are predicted not to do well in school and not to do well in life. But we found out if we use language as our biggest, our biggest goal and we uh, approach it through many different ways that we can make that prediction not, do, not come true. And that's the good news story. By the way, we use lots of visual reminders in classrooms, like a little poster like this, reminding us of some of the things we're doing. And now I'm going to give you three words, which are the, our mantra for Abyssinarian, that what makes it different than many other early childhood programs is that you do these activities individually, you do them frequently, and you do them intentionally. And that, if you do that, I can guarantee your teaching will be different than the day before when you didn't do that. Um, now, everybody in this room who's got any kind of early childhood background is recognizing all of these things as familiar. They're not brand new. They're different mainly in focus, in sharpness of the way they're applied, and the fact that they are done individually and frequently and intentionally. And the good news is that if you do that, if you shift your way of teaching uh, so that the way you're interacting has those qualities, you will change the outcome, especially for the lowest children in your classroom. And the other good news is you don't have to do this with everybody in your classroom. There may be three children who are your target children in the classroom. And you use this. Uh, you use a much more general approach with other kids and group activities and so forth. But I think that that's uh, really useful for you to think about um, as, as a kind of a mantra, as, as I said, and a, and a kind of a, a goal, an aspirational goal. Nobody can do this right off the bat. I, trained so many people and they said, no, no way can I do this. It's really, it's too hard, it's too impossible. But it, but it turns out that people can shift 
their view of how their time is used and what I do as a teacher. So let me now talk a bit, since this is a university group, talk a little bit about, about the theoretical under, underpinnings. We didn't just uh, accidentally come upon this. We, it's a theory-based approach, uh, but it's also very practical. But the first theoretical idea that we really focused on is Vygotsky. And Vygotsky was, in the US, was brand new at the time we were starting this. That We, we barely knew about Vygotsky, even though he had been published many years ago in Russia. Uh, but he, he was published in the U.S. at about that time. And I'll, I'll tell you the part of Vygotsky that we use especially. And the second one is Piaget, because Piaget had been around for a good while and we knew about him. And we knew that Piaget had studied children so that he kind of mapped out the logical pr progression that their, that their learning went through. And we used those uh, those steps that Piaget had identified as a guide to how we placed activities and, and um, so forth. And then there is a concept called joint attention, which is more, more recent. And the very first, there have been hundreds of publications about joint attention now, but the very first uh, publication that we can find is from Chafee and Bruner at Harvard University. And uh, it, it, it is a kind of a revelation that when the adult and the child get their attention on the same thing or the same event, that wonderful things happen. Wonderful things happen in the brain of the child. And rapid <coughs> growth and rapid learning happens as opposed to the kind of slow growth that happens through many random events. Okay. And this, by the way, is my paraphrase of one of the, the statements from Vygotsky, is that the way in which the high, child's higher mental functions are formed are through mediated activities shared with an adult or a more competent peer. That basically means that children get smarter when they interact with somebody who's smarter than they are. I mean, that's essentially what it means, that uh, it's great for children to learn from free play, they learn a lot, they learn a lot from peers, but they learn rapidly and more complex things when they interact with an adult or with a, uh, a, an older peer. So let me give you just a couple of little shots here that show uh, what I mean by mediated activities. And the term you'll hear me using instead of that a lot is simply adult-child interaction. Because when the adult is interacting with the child, if, it, if you're doing it skillfully, you are mediating that, that activity. That is, you're doing value added. You're making that activity more than it was when the child simply did it on his own. And the absolutary approach is focusing on mediated activities. And what that means is that we are looking for less of this kind of situation and more of that kind of situation. And of course, all of you looking in, in, the, in the room who are maybe have a, a group of toddlers right now are saying, well, I would love to be able to do this, but the reality is, is I have lots of children. And I'm just trying to acknowledge the fact that, that that is our reality. But I'm telling you, I've seen many, many people take that real reality and turn it into something that's really quite different and has a very, very different outcome for ch from children. Um, I'm not going to talk about this slide. It's very, very dense in text, but I put it on here simply to say that when we do training, we are training toward activities that have all of these uh, characteristics, and they don't have them all at the same time. You see joint attention down here, task orientation. But notice that the activities are responsive. The child is building on the, uh, I mean, the adult is building on the child's behavior. Um, we have actually measured the behaviors of children, teachers who have been, who have been trained in Abbasidarian, and their behaviors become more responsive to the children. I'm really pleased with that, out, that outcome because many people say, oh, if, you, if we use your program, we will be kind of directing the kids and, and making things unnatural. That's not really what happens when you really understand So let's turn now to the, the research because one of the things, besides the characteristics of the program that I just talked about, 
that uh, is, distinguishes Abbasidarian is the number of studies, that scientific studies that have been done on it. And you'll see down here that there are more than 200 peer-reviewed peer art articles. And so this makes it one of the most studied, perhaps the most studied program in the world. <clears throat> and so let's give some results. We're looking now at children's IQs, that is their cognitive development, uh, which are above 84. We were very concerned at the beginning, and our government was very concerned at the beginning about poor children who slid, whose IQs and cognitive development slid down over time. And they ended up in special education or needing special services, not because they had Down syndrome or had any other mental retardation con condition, but they simply got further and further behind. So that they eventually had to have special services, which is very expensive to cost more than twice as much as regular education. So we divided our group of, of children into uh, the group that was going to get this program we were devising and children who got business as usual. They either stayed at home or they went to a different, different daycare center based on what the family wanted. And this is what happened to them in terms of their cognitive development. This, I'm going to show you first, is the uh, um, treatment group, the one who got abecedarian. And 100% of them are above that range. That, in other words, they're in the normal cognitive development range. A few of them drop out of that toward uh, as time goes by, but that happens in the general population as well. But this is what happened with the untreated group. They simply went progressively downhill, and by this time, for example, here, 45% of them are, no, are, are in the normal range, which means 55% of them were below the normal range. So that's, that's bad news. We don't want kids to be uh, that many kids by age uh, 49 months to be dropping out of the normal range of cognitive development. And so that's, in fact, we, we were demonstrating right in that very first study that we were accomplishing what we set out to do was to prevent this downward slide uh, that happens with, with no treatment. Now, let's uh, jump ahead, and as I often say, this is through the magic of longitudinal research. These are the same children you saw on the previous slide, and we're gonna look at how many of them graduated from, from a four-year university. And for the kids who were in the control group, that is, they either went to some, some other daycare or they, or they stayed at home, with the, the parents are enacting. And remember, these are all very high risk group kids. <coughs> Low education in, in the family, uh, poverty in the family, other risk factors. 6% of these had graduated from the university compared to 23% of the other group, the ones who got the adversary approach for the first five years of life. And that's almost a four, one more point that would have been a fourfold in, increase. That's a huge, huge effect on the lives of those children. And we have a number, of, a couple of documentaries that have been done, one on, uh, from, by National Geographic and one by a foundation called the Genesis Foundation, which follows some of these kids into adulthood and interviews them into adulthood. And there, it's, it's just, really gratifying to see them as competent adults who are have their own businesses and are doing their own uh, thing and are, are fulfilling uh, their you know their their uh, potential not their destiny because their destiny was not to do very well they were from a group that had never done well in the past on average by the way on 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 average if one group let's say poorly educated parents and poverty level parents those kids do more poorly than the general population. One or two kids, a few kids, will surprise you and do amazingly well. And what that tells you is that it doesn't, it's not, doesn't have to be true that everybody does that, but on average, they do that. Now we ch turn that around. That so on average, they, they look like more advantaged uh, kids and kids from more advantaged families. Uh, this is the Nobel laureate, James Heckman, which can I suspect is a familiar name to you. And he was involved with analyzing our data and also analyzing it from a health point of view. Because after 
the kids who were grown up, they were 35 to 40 years old, we gave them all a physical exam. We took blood samples and measured cholesterol. We measured, we measured uh, um, blood, blood, blood pressure and all the things that would tell you what, whether you're healthy or not. And this is uh, Heckman's comment. He said, they didn't know, and certainly those of us who invented the, pro the program didn't know, this was going to have an educational program, was going to have a health effect. I mean, that's really good news. You're, you're in a very good profession in that you can do something that affects multiple aspects of a person's life, and um, in including this area, which makes this person happier and healthier, and for society, it, it prevents a lot of costs that come along with poor health. Uh, these are just some of the figures uh, that that are actually the, the, the data. And uh, I will just comment that this is not showing boys and girls separately, but we the health effects were stronger for, for males than for females. And that's good news, and that's the direction it should be, because males have more health problems. They die younger, they all, all sorts of things, you know. So um, that's, uh, that's not expected, but it's, it's really good news, I think. Now, I want to give you now a totally different kind of data, which is data on the teachers who receive training. Many of you in this room, I suspect, have received uh, training as practitioners or as coaches from Kimberly Meunier. And uh, what we found out of the people who were practitioners who were using the child care, this pr approach in their, in their daycare or, or family daycare homes, we had people go in and observe them and code their behavior. And these are the differences that we found. There were richer language interactions. This is showing that it's significant. There was more support for vocabulary. And the one I liked the most is they were more responsive to children. Not that they were more didactic and directive. They were more responsive to children. And that's people going in and not, not just rating, but actually coding minute by minute the teacher's behavior. Now, I, I'm, by the way, I'm skipping between studies. We have, we have have had at least ten major studies on this, on the, with different populations, and uh, in different in, in different countries. So I'm going to focus now on one that was done in eight cities around the United States, and they were all with low birth weight babies. Uh, these are all children that are born below the weight that you would you would hope for a baby to be healthy and, and so forth. And we decided that. You know, historically, those children do a little less well on average than kids who are born at normal weight. And low birth weight happens more frequently among un un undereducated and poorer families. And so we were still dealing with uh, a population that had a lot of other things going, um, not going well for it. But low birth weight happens across the spectrum to to well-off families as well. And notice we had college graduates. These, these are the mother's educations here. We had college graduates in our group, all the way down to people who hadn't graduated even from high school. And now what you're looking at, the, the, the groups are equalized at the beginning, they were randomized, and what we're looking at is their cognitive, cognitive development at age 36 months of age, which is how long we intervened from birth to 36 months of age. These are their exit scores. And notice that we didn't do much of anything. We didn't do, <laughs> I shouldn't say much, we didn't do anything for the kids who were from families with college-educated mothers. They were going to do well anyway, and they were going to be the highest of any, any of the groups. But if you look at those other, those other bars, even the mothers who had some college, uh, you, you can see a difference between the treated and the untreated ones and here. And look at this really big difference for the low birth weight babies who were from moms who had not even graduated from high school. And just kind of look at that, at that slope of that, uh, that outcome. That's what is generally called a social gradient. That is, the, the thought was in the past, you know, that the kind of class you were in society determine how you're going to do in health or how you're going to do in education, how you're going to do, do cognitively. Well, the truth is it may appear to determine it, but it doesn't have to determine it. And here's what you see. 
we can't affect that group that's the most advantaged. But for everybody else, we can practically level out that playing field. That's, that's really good news that these kids from the moms who haven't even graduated from high school are doing just about as well as the moms, uh, the kids of moms who have graduated or have had two or three years of college. Um, so I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. And of course, in the Kid Start program, you are focusing a great deal on this particular group right here. And there's about a 15 point IQ difference at age 36. That's, that's a huge, huge difference. And uh, we don't, uh, well, I was gonna to try to interpret something about what that means, but, we, but we, we know that it's good and we know that it's going to carry forward in terms of the child's uh, many characteristics of the child as, as the child goes further. So, what does the research say about the importance of parent-child interactions and child, uh, for child development? Somebody asked me to make sure I put that topic in because I say so much about why we focus on language a lot. Um, and, you know, language happens in, in this kind of setting for very young children and oops wait a minute it feels like i went to the wrong slide oh i guess i read that wrong this says language and quality interaction what did the er earlier thing say somebody correct me oh what does it say about the importance of parent child Interactions, not about language. I'm sorry, I can't read my own slides. <laughs> that's what. That's the problem. When you kind of depend upon the slides to keep you on track, you, you can sometimes make make a mistake. Well, let's uh, let's look at uh, the study that I have next, which is a study, interestingly enough, fairly recently published in 2016 in the journal Pediatrics, which is a very high-level journal, and. It, it's a unique study in that it was done simultaneously in India, Pakistan, and Zambia, so middle and lower income uh, countries. They did it with their health visitors, and they visited families who uh, were either, either had high resources, those are the high resource families, or low resources. I'm only showing you one of those groups there right now. But they visited them every two weeks from the time they were in the first year of life when they were born up until 36 months of age and then measured them all along the way in a longitudinal design. And the high resource families, look at this, they were, they were doing better than the low resource families by 12 months of age. And the two groups, the abecedarian group is a dotted line and the control group just tracked along just about the same. There's no real difference in those two groups even though the lines appear to cross. Interesting thing is, all everybody in this study got the same number of visits, a visit every two weeks. Everybody got a curriculum. The others got, um, as I think I say in here, got the World Health Organization health education curriculum for the parents. So they were not untreated parents, but the other kids got the, the health education curriculum plus the abecedarian approach. And this is what happened to them. They started down here with this, this group, and they progressed from 12 months to 20 to 36 months until they are equal, absolutely indistinguishable, indistinguishable from those kids. That's really, really good news. This is the first time that 2016 study, first time that's ever been demonstrated in the world that this really at-risk group, and the one from low resources, could end up equally the one with higher resources. And, and that's when we talk about an intervention or something for, for lower, lower economic children, that's what we're always hoping for, is they're, they're, we're gonna close the gap. We're going to help them not look different, but look like the more advantaged members of society. And I think uh, these researchers who did a much more elegant kind of design than we were able to do when we first started studying this, uh, have demonstrated a, a, a really important 
uh, principle, and they demonstrated it through home visiting, which is much less expensive than uh, child care, for example. So there's many things that are quite important about that study. So let's talk about language. I think many of you have seen the Hart and Risley data, which basically says how many words do children from three different socioeconomic levels, uh, how many words do they hear? And this is showing that even by 12 months, these are words in millions, uh, that they're, they're beginning to be different. But the differences get bigger and bigger as you go along. And that's where we get the, the 45 minus 13 is where we get the 30 million word gap that you hear about. That, that the difference in what these kids have heard and that those kids by 48 months of, of life is about 30 million words, which is which you can't, you, you know that these kids have got to have an advantage in terms of, of uh, learning language if, if they've learned that. Well, one of the reasons we have such intense in interest in language in child care is so that if these kids are, the, are our target people, in, in, um, sorry, in, in child care, that we're going to push that number up quite a ways in our child care just by uh, the attention we give to language. And we're also, like that mother you heard at the beginning, we're going to have that mother rethink how she interacts with her child and, and to use much more language with them. So now I'm switching to the topic of just where has this program been in the world? And where, is it, where did it start? Where is it not? And here's just a map I'll just give you a moment to look at. It started in the United States. And these red dots are the research areas. And uh, the areas that Kimberly and, and I are, are uh, act, act, actively working in right now are um, up here in, in um, Connecticut. Actually, we don't have a dot on there for that yet, but, and we've got, we have to get a dot there. Uh, we're working in those two Canadian provinces. We've worked fairly recently in Mexico. We're working in, in Jordan. Uh, we're working in France, and we're working in Denmark. There's a brand new randomized study that has been just now funded in Denmark and will start toward the end of this year, and uh, that's very, really interesting. We're working in, in China. Here's a randomized study that's going on there, and we're still working in Australia. So there are quite a number of places around the world. We're not trying to promote this in a sense of systematically going around and saying, here's a great program for you. We're just going where the door is open, where people contact us and say, we're interested in your program. We, we've read the research, and will you come and help us get started? So let me see, I think I'm getting near my, my um, end of my talk, but I, I, since this is a university group, I thought I would put in some information about how uh, the Abstinent Approach has been used in university settings. And it's been used in four-year university settings and also in two-year university settings. Um, so um, here is uh, a, what's called college. I don't know how you use the word college in, in Singapore. It actually means the same thing as high school in where, where we live in, um, uh, excuse me, in, in Australia. It means the same thing as high school. Whereas we tend to use it to mean university, you know. And um, so I don't know exactly, but the Red River College is a two year uh, university. So that's what, that's what it is. And they have done some really interesting work. They have developed, uh, wow. This is <laughs> uh, they have developed a website where they can train people at a distance and then follow up with on-site on -site coaching. And, uh, and they also have coached this particular uh, child care center that you saw a mother speaking from right at, right at the beginning of the program. Um, Quebec is a French-speaking French -speaking province in Canada, and Kimberly is the one who is fluent in 
in French with, with us. I, I can't get more than two words out. And she uh, has trained them and is um, really interested in the fact that this uh, two-year community college, which is called Cijap Saint Jerome, uh, Cijap is a French uh, a word in Canada that means a, a two-year college, um, has, has trained already 5,000 people in service. That's they're, they're the place that's trained more people in the world than anybody, anybody else. And they had a re really big grant from a foundation and from the government to do that. And just this year, they began to work with 15 other institutions to help them do it. And they've already this year trained a, more than 500 people, in a, some of whom are university faculty members and some of whom are students. So that's a, an interesting story in and of itself. And the reason I'm saying that is to SUSS and any other organizations. If you want to go down this road, it's quite possible, and other people have done it before. And in Victoria, Australia, where I'm also a professor, uh, they've already um, trained 976 people at the master's degree level. So that really does show there's a good bit of, of uh, work going on as we speak around the world. These are some, some research studies that have been going on and that, and that are fact still going on. And I won't go over them in, in detail except to say that right now with the very first kids you saw on the slide there there is a 40-year brain scan study going on where the children are going into the functional MRI and solving problems now they're not children of course they're 35 and 40 years old uh, that's, they're my children so that's why I keep thinking of that but anyway uh, they solve problems differently than the people who didn't get this so we're, we're really interested in the fact that we've got technology now to, 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 uh, to, to mark, mark how the program has changed the kids over the source of their, course of their lives. This is a family, uh, a play group happening right now in the south of China, and uh, that's a randomized study uh, funded by the China Development Research Foundation. So, let me, someone tell me where we are in terms of time. Who is, who is my timekeeper? <laughs> Another 15 minutes, okay. What I have now is a series of slides that try to give you a peek at the program itself, you know, a few slides. I'm gonna to try to move through this quickly, but there are some videos for each one of the four, the four ideas, so let's go through. I'll try to keep my comments down too, a minimum, but just let you think about each of those big four areas and see what they actually look like. One of my videos is in Spanish, <laughs> so I suspect Spanish is not a real common language around here. Um, but it's fun to watch the adult and the, and the child interacting in Spanish. She, the adult uses English occasionally, uh, but you can hear her counting in Spanish, you can hear her naming things. The, the word for ball is pelota in Spanish, and you'll hear her saying that word over and over again. So let's go ahead and look at language priority. Uh, this is uh, that people are guided use, to use the, three, the three N strategy, and three N can make an ordinary, a spontaneous event into a learning event. strategy can be used at any time during the day. You don't have to have a plan. You can have it in your mind and use it at any time, like when something interesting happens. The three ends are notice, nudge, narrate. When you use notice, you're letting your child know that you're paying attention and you're interested in what she's doing. I'm watching you put that stick in the sand. Yeah. When you use nudge, 
You're making a suggestion that might add something to what she's already doing. What would happen if you put more sticks next to that one? More sticks? When a child takes your suggestion and brings it into her play, her brain is growing. When you use narrate, you're telling the story of what is happening. You can use interesting words. You put all your sticks next to each other. They are in a row. I think it looks like a fence. You can move between the steps for as long as you and your child are playing together. Ah, you're taking the sticks out of the sand. What will you do next? That was created by the Northern Territory government as a training tape, especially for their parents. These are, these are cartoon illustrations of indigenous people in Australia, and they have, they have republished this, this curriculum so that every child and parent in the whole curriculum is, is an indigenous person. So they've really taken uh, it seriously about contextualizing it and making it culturally appropriate. So going on now to enriched caregiving, uh, there are significant amounts of time that people are using caregiving, and that's one of the reasons why we uh, really have included that as a really important part of, of the adversarial approach. And uh, we, want, we want to make that and what we call enriched caregiving. And by enriched caregiving, we mean that the care gets done, but there is a, an emotional oops, but there, uh, that there is an emotional connection, that there's a really strong um, sense of closeness, of I'm, I'm paying attention to you, uh, I care about you, and so there's a sense of connection during that time. And then, beyond that, there's a, a sense of, con there's some effort to put content in it. This, this person is singing a little song or playing a little game during that time. But you might just, if you're diapering the, 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 the child, you might say, oh, th this is what I'm going to do first, and then I'm going to do this, and this is what I'll do last. You know, so you might be talking about sequence and so forth, which the child is certainly not going to really understand in a deep way. But if you say those things enough times, it's going to eventually make some sense to the child and is going to be the, the way the child's understanding is built. This is what we use in training. We, we ask people to think about some of the, the routines and there could be more than this and that for every one of those, you could be for changing diapers and so forth. You could talk about colors, about counting, about sizes, shapes, processes, emotions, rhyming, and vocabulary. In other words, those are just some of the content possibilities. You come up with others. And so there is a lot of possibility here. And you can keep changing the content that you use. And you get a lot of teaching done just during the routines of the day. Now here's a, here's a caregiver, the one that I said speaks in Spanish. Let's see. Picking up toys for okay, caregiving. Oh, bravo. Okay, bravo. My mommy. Okay, what I'm saying? What I'm saying in Sulugar. Italian. Eh, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm Notice there are other kids in the room. She has a focus child. Vamos right? a recoger por otro lado. Okay. Ve a recoger un muñequito. Recoge el muñequito, por favor, y lo pones en la caja. Okay, guárdalo. Thank you. Recoge <laughs> la pelota. 
Hello to Bon. Una. Una, she's counting. ¿Qué más? Mira eso, mami. El muñequito. Gracias. Anyway, the point the point is this this person is making picking up the toys a uh, occasion for learning. And it's jump jump gently and, and with fun and and with taking care of about four other children that are around nearby. Conversational reading goes back and forth. The really What's really different about this compared to regular, more typical reading is that you do something, the child does something, you do something. And when I say something, that means that you not always talk. Sometimes it's a point, sometimes it's a look, and you learn to accept all of those behaviors as part of the child's conversation. Uh, let's look at this Chinese father who is doing something. Oh, <laughs> Notice that he's using joint attention, naming the picture that the child looks at. The child didn't stop and he didn't name anything. <laughs> I don't know Chinese enough to be, to be amused by that. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, this what is what is really great about it, that that father just this moment learned that technique. I mean, he gets it on the first time that he's gonna he's gonna let the child determine the page. He's gonna wait for uh, a behavior. Not gonna be the language. Not going to be, there might be a little point you, you saw there, but it's mainly going to be looks. Now, this child happened to have a really clear way of looking <laughs> like that. But if the child doesn't do that, one, what we say is sit, sit around, not behind the child, but to the side, so you can see where the eyes are going. We have a nice videotape of Kimberly doing that with a child in Canada, and she can see where the child's eyes So she, she could be just as skillful on that with, with less obvious movement from the child. Oh, by the way, this uh, that institute that was that was mentioned at the end, they have undertaken to translate all these materials and to train many, many healthcare professionals in China in terms of using this. In they use it in maternal and child health hospitals, which is really interesting to me. And the last part of it is learning games, um, and um, learning games have now been published in quite a number of places around the world and the here, researchers have distilled the latest scientific theories on child development into 200 learning games however simple each game had a hidden agenda one of the important principles of teaching is follow the child's lead because if the child is into something that's something they're ready to learn Mine. Can you get one like mine? It's not a matter of just throwing stuff in my hand. You got it. You basically say, what is this child likely to be comfortable doing right now? What has he got the capabilities for? And then you do something that stretches him just a little. That idea you can tell is from Vygotsky, the, the zone of maximal development. You you stretch the child just a bit, and notice that we were using. I was using just three blocks, two that are alike and one that's different. And I was getting discrimination there in a very, very simple um, um, methodology. And one of the things about learning games and about the approach is that it gets activities down to some very simple starting places so that then there are many steps along the way that the child can move along in a progression. I think we are now through. Uh, there, there are our emails in case you want to ask a question or anything. It's uh, been a real pleasure to be here at SUSS, and I think we're going to have time for some questions or comments. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what 
those of you who have, have, have even used this program uh, or have been trying it out, uh, if you have any comments of what you've noticed and if you uh, want to ask you know, questions of somebody else in the room may be able to answer better than me. Can we give Prof. Stalling a round of applause, please? Uh, thank you, Prof. Stalling, for a very insightful and interesting lecture. Uh, so now we'll be moving on to our Q&A section. Um, and at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Associate Professor Chan Lin Ho to be our moderator for the Q&A session. Uh, so AP Chan has 30 years of experience with early childhood, curriculum development, leadership, and policy. And she's currently with the S.R. Nardin School of Human Development and Social Services at SUSS. Um, and she also lectures in courses including life coaching and birth to tree responsive curriculum. So AP Chan is also involved in ad advising, training, and mentoring Kid Start practitioners and has played a pivotal role in advocating for AA and incorporating it into the curriculum we use for Kid Start uh, playgroups. Um, so now we'll open the floor for questions, uh, but just a quick note, because we have a limited amount of time for questions, uh, we are giving out a few index cards as well, so you can use the index cards to write down questions, and if you have a question, you can raise your hand and pass the cards to uh, some of our staff along the sides there. Um, and also, um, you can use the mics, uh, the mics will be going around for you to ask questions. We just ask that you uh, introduce yourself, your name, uh, where you're from, and you keep your questions as concise as possible. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll hand the time over to uh, Prof. Chan. Thanks, Daryl. My test. Uh, it's good to see so many of you here on a weekday afternoon. Uh, some of you have taken time off your busy schedule, especially when you're working in centres. Uh, and I'm so glad to see all of you here. Uh, we are so um, encouraged and privileged to have Professor Sparling uh, visit Singapore and to meet so many important people you know, during this short and intensive week. So um, perhaps as you're getting your questions ready, uh, just maybe you would like to uh, either write it down or, or uh, raise your hands if you are uh, you have a question in mind. We have ushers with the mics. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So um, as Daryl said, please introduce yourself, your name, and the organisation that you represent. Thank you. Hi, Ku uh, Kinju here. Um, one of the key hats I'm wearing now is as the founder director of Preschool for Multiple Intelligences. My question, uh, Prof, is um, the studies that's been done look at either uh, kids who are doing this at home with their parents or in a center or a group. So um, are there, are there um, also studies that kind of have both going on together as compared to those who have only the parents or only the centers? And what might be the difference uh, if that is the case? Yes, there, there are studies that combine home visiting and, uh, and child care. And uh, I was, by the way, I did a lot of violence to some of these studies by <laughs> abbreviating them and not telling very. But the study on the low birth weight children was on, on visiting and child care at the same time. In fact, the whole first year was just visiting because those kids are sick at birth, you know, in the first year of life. So we were afraid that, that, that daycare was not going to be a good idea for them. So we just visited the first year. The second and third year, they came into child care, plus they got home visiting. And that and you saw some of those results up there with like a 15-point IQ difference between the, the, those children who were from mothers of, uh, had, who hadn't graduated from high school. There are other programs like the one I told you about from Zambia, India, and Pakistan that are totally home visit. And, so, and those, I, what I'm rather encouraged by is that program, which is less intense, which is less frequent, still got quite strong results. Now, I cannot tell you why, why that is. We're, we're just kind of uh, trying out different methodologies, and so far, each one of them has shown pretty strong results. Um, is that? Can I have a very quick follow-up? Uh, would you then recommend that, uh, it's, it might seem obvious, that uh, for better results and outcome, it would be better to have a center base as well to be followed up together or to have it simultaneously with a home program done by the parents? Well, I, I, I hate to say what is best in terms of delivery because some parents absolutely do not want to use child care and they will be very receptive to a home visit program. And I don't want to say, oh, your child's not gonna do well if you only get them into childcare. 
I think that there are alternative paths to getting good results with this program, which is really surprises me to a great deal, because we thought it was just going to be a child care program at the beginning. And we found out, no, when you, take the, when you take the actual program, that is what people do day by day, and put it in a different delivery mode, it still seems to work and get strong child and parent results. So I hesitate to say what is the most, I suspect child care combined with home visiting is perhaps the most powerful way of, of logically, it would be the most powerful way. And, and I have, I would personally never ever do a, ch a child care program again that didn't have a strong parent engagement part. I know that we need to switch to some other people. Thank you. Okay, we have a question. Hi, Professor. Hi, I enjoyed the um, presentation that you've got and I appreciated those data uh, statistics that you've put forth. I was just wondering, has this approach been adopted in schools um, that are targeted towards kids from privileged background? Or is this heavily concentrated on, you know, kids from... All, all of the research studies have been primarily, almost, primary, almost, almost exclusively, uh, on disadvantaged children. And that, for us, the reason that's our kind of social mission, that's the children we're most concerned about. That's kind of where, where, what we want to make a difference in. It turns out that middle class parents and even parents like you, you saw these with these parents that had college educations, they love the program <laughs> and they try to get their kids enrolled in it. Um, Is there any way, um, because you did mention there was one slide where you showed an IQ curve, uh, more, more of like a sharing of your, you did briefly mention something about IQ, about it being like one point something. Well, I, I will tell you that we this program does not raise the IQ of advantaged children. It does True. not do that. It only raises the IQ of children who are predicted to have low performance, low IQ. It, it makes that prediction not come through. And if, if it raised the IQ of middle class parents, they would be all over the... I would be a rich man. Right? <laughs> because I was wondering that this approach is being provided for... Um, I mean, it's being provided to countries that are um, pretty much third world, second world no, country. No, 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 no. Australia is not a third world country. No, I mean, you were country. talking about Jordan just now. Jordan, yes. uh, you know, with... with Countries primarily have like uh, excess quality education, quality preschool, quality uh, early child educators per se. In in each of these countries, the people that we work with are targeting the most needy families in their population. They're, all societies care about that. Uh, it may be an advantaged country, but all advantaged countries have a slice of the population that's not doing as well as others. That's who we work with in a country. In fact, that's who we're working with in Singapore, is, is your ECDA who is targeting those kids to see if we can't equalize things out a bit. Uh, and so I personally am never going to do a research study on middle class kids because what's the, what's the point? Also, just one quick one for our uh, brain study. Uh, we need to the share the mic with study, others. The brain study publication, do we, would we get access to to read the um, brain study publication, that, which is due to be published in 2018, sometime this year? 21? The brain study publication about the age 40 um, yes. um, kids who have already been given this approach at the age of 40 that you guys did mention you're going to do a brain study, a brain yes. scan there, study. There is a so would that publication be given to the public? It, it is already available to the public. I can give a reference to. I can leave a reference to somebody. That yes, we will. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll we will. We will Thank let you. you all know have the reference. Thank you so much. Perfect. Is there anybody else who has a question for me from this side of the hall? Yes. Hi, Professor. Hi. Um, I have one question uh, because it's funny. I was thinking about. Uh, is there a minimum threshold in terms of how much exposure children need to have on uh, for the basic area approach, whether it's in conversation reading uh, or the learning games, to, to get that kind of results? We, we don't have a really good, clear answer to that. We have, we have counted the number had teachers count the number, that is how many times have we done conversational reading, how many learning games do we play, and, and so forth, uh, in, in a number of studies. And what, what uh, 
it shows is there is a linear relationship. The more you do, the better the child does. Uh, it's, it's like a dose response curve. And we haven't come up or, or tried to come up with a cutoff point that the child is not going to perform. We did have one study uh, in which people counted the number of childcare days that children attended and, and to figure out was there a point at which you were not getting an effect. And I will tell you that uh, thinking about a five day week and a full year, you know, probably 50 weeks out of the year, you know, would be closed to two, two weeks or maybe, maybe three, that if the child attends at least three days a week, you're beginning to get um, a pretty good effect. But if the child attends four days or four and a half days, you get a big effect. Four and a half days is like full time. I mean, it's just like it's hardly ever absent. But the difference between just coming three days a week and four and a half days a week is a very big difference in outcome. So there's something going on at about that frequency. Now that's child care outcomes. And I, I, I hesitate to talk about this because because I don't want people to look and see what is the minimum we can do. We ought to be doing the maximum we can do for kids. I mean, seriously, this is kind of a moral and an ethical question that we have. And I, I would really encourage you uh, to, to think of, you're going to think of what parents need, what children need, and deliver that rather than what is the least I can get away with. I, I know you didn't say that, but, but that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of implied when we look for what is the what is the threshold. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else has a question you'd like to raise? Don't be shy. So, what are the resources that you can actually have to if you are going to try this approach? So your question is, what are the resources that you can tap on if you want to try this approach? Well, first of all, um, we certainly hope everybody who does the approach will go through some training. I mean, you, you can certainly, there are, there are learning games books out there that are published in Australia and, and in the U.S. that anybody can buy and use. There's not much direction about how to use them. But the learning games are a, that is their paper products that you can get. As, but you, you can also uh, get some handouts. If you're in training, Kimberly will give you quite a big batch of things that talk about conversational reading or, or so forth. We don't make these just generally available to the public because we think that simply seeing the paper is not going to hack it. We think it's mainly going to be if you've really thought about this and you've done some role plays and you've done some feedback and discussion that you're going to be a good practitioner. So we're kind, we're kind of struggling with that, how to reach more people. And we do have a website that uh, if, that is, can be made available. And um, it, it's something we're, we're not quite sure where that's going to go. But, but I, I appreciate it is, it is, if you're not engaged in a center who's specifically planning to, to roll this out, you are at a little bit of a loss as an individual, you know, where do I go and get this information, where do I get the training, but we're trying to fix that if we can. We have a, we have a brand new edu Abyssinian Education Foundation, which we're going to try, through that, we're going to try to make things much more readily available to the broader spectrum of people. Thank you. We have a hand there, Lavina. Hi, my name is Lavina from Wiggleports. I just want to have a quick question with the, all the statistics that you have shown. Primarily, the intervention group is from is less than four years old. So, is this the target age group that we're looking at? So, not the five and six. So. Yes. So That's four and right. below, zero to four and starting as early, near to birth as you can. Uh, we, this, is, this program is based on the idea of, of cognitive growth, which means, that means your brain, but what's inside here, cognitive growth. It's a physical thing that's happening inside your head. And the period from birth to 36 months is a very, very productive 
period. So many connections are made and lost during that time that having a really strong experience base during that time can change the whole trajectory of your of your of your life and your learning. So we have not been interested in starting at three or four years of age uh, because other programs have done that. And uh, we first personally think of with the group that we're talking about, the low education, the low income group, it's it's kind of uh, unconscionable to start and wait until they're three years of age because they will, they will have lost so much ground by that time. So this is a program that is meant to start from the get-go to support the, the weakest children in our family and our family of children and to support, give them all the support they need to be like everybody else. Let, let me just give you a kind of a quote that I don't even know who it came from, but, that it, but I had someone say to me that societies will be judged by how they treat their weakest citizens. And I think that is a really good moral way to think about it, that we have, as, as a society, some kind of obligation because of, of, of us who are in good, comfortable positions in society, and, we're, and our kids are going to do really well, to not sit by idly and say, oh, those kids are doomed to always be at the bottom of the glass. Because they're not doomed. They're, it's simply because things are unequally available in the society, and, and we have the power to change that very substantially. And it, and it does take effort, it takes, it takes money, but it takes something in your heart and in your head uh, to really be willing to do that. So your, your thought about starting at three and four stimulated that idea in me. I, I personally don't want to stimulate to wait until that time because it means those kids are going to have gone through a really unfortunate period of their lives that didn't have to happen. You. Is there any more questions you'd like to bring up? Uh, Professor, this is not a question, but a, a, a basically a comment. Please identify uh, sorry, yourself. Yeah. I'm, I'm Rahayu. I'm basically from uh, PPIS Singapore Muslim Women Organization. I'm the president also the advisor for the the Chahu sector uh, in my organization. Um, I think because in, I'm, I'm very much inspired by, because I've attended the 3 days training by Kimberly, and I would want to say that if there's a question in terms of how do we make this thing work in our community in terms of assisting, because currently we're talking about social inequality. How do we actually close the gap? And this is something that should be taken not as a program for us to actually do with our children, but it has to be a mission that it has to be done. Because if you look at the philosophy of Abyssidarian uh, approach, is actually to provide an ecology where we actually work with the young children to give a head start. You know, so if there's anything going to make it work, it's basically the belief that this is a mission that we have to do in our community for our children, and especially if we really want to work towards social inequality that the government has been talking about. I mean, that's how I think about this program. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, Rohayu. Okay, we have um, one written question here. Okay, the first question is the question I asked earlier. Second question, in working with parents who are of a lower income group, are there certain qualities they must already possess? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do you work with the less motivated parents to carry out your visitarian? That's interesting. I had that question in, in a, at a luncheon meeting the other day. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad I don't know who answered that question because I'm going to say something again that kind of pounces on <laughs> what, what you said. Um, and I, I don't want to, you know, fuss at us, but we, ha we have, as middle class parents, as advantaged members of society, a way of judging uh, people who are poor, who have had problems with the law, maybe they've had problems with, with substance abuse. All of those groups have, been, have used the absolute approach. 
and say, oh, they, you know, they, they've got to get up to a certain point before they can take part in this program that I'm going to deliver them, deliver to them. We, we need to be to have faith in parents that they all really want to do the best for their kids. And given the opportunity, they may say, well, they may not do exactly as we want them to do, but they all have a substantial capacity for um, taking up an opportunity where no opportunity has been before. I think that's the big thing in my notion. People mainly don't achieve because of lack of opportunity. That is, the, the things are simply not available to them. Something is out of range in terms of cost, or it's out of range, or, or maybe it's physically too far away from you, you know, if you have no transportation. So I, I think that we need to believe that if we can, if there's target parents we're concerned about, we want to offer a program to them, that they will rise to the occasion to respond. And there's, there's no prerequisites, and there are no things that, that, that we can't say, oh, they're not going to be motivated or not. Of course it's true in some ways that, that we see lack of motivation and, and so forth. But in general, uh, we've got to believe that parents can rise to the occasion. And given that opportunity, uh, uh, they, they can. Uh, your, your DPM has used the uh, the concept of a trampoline, you know, that, that if we're going to do something for people, they may bounce back up, you know. Uh, and I think we, we have to believe that that lack of motivation is, is in our minds as much as in, in the parents. Thank you. Yes, push back. Hi. I think that the nicest many familiar faces here. Um, just to share and add on to that question of lack of motivation from parents. I've recently been with EDGA and working on a kids club program. I work on a home visitation program visiting parents of low-income families, families at risk, families of vulnerable, and also once a week play group sessions engaging parents, and also children at child care centers coming from this background and engaging parents. From all these settings, I must say, they all have, all these parents have aspirations and hopes for their children. They all have it. It's just that they are in such a state of circumstances and settings that makes it difficult. So I, I really would like to ask each one of you here, we all have a part to play. Let's not make judgments. Let's go towards what we really need to do. And I had this session with a parent and I was trying to engage the parent in this visitorian approach at home with a, a colleague of mine who is a home visitor. And the mother said, I can't speak English. I can't do it. And the home visitor said, it's okay. You use what language you are comfortable. Your, your own mother tongue. Whatever is feasible for you. Start from where you can. You don't have to go big. You don't have to do conversational reading straight away. Start with whatever you are doing on a daily basis. And you saw in rich caregiving. How many times in a day you are with the child providing care? Start from there. And you can do it. And the most beautiful part of it is it, this approach is not expensive. All it takes is you. I've seen many other approaches that are so expensive in terms of resources. It's beyond us. But this calls us, the individual. So I'm talking about motivation of parents. I had one mother during, in the child care center where I engaged her family. And she was doing the tree and approach with the child. And she told me, oh, Miss Pushpa, I've lost precious moments with my child. I wish I had known this earlier. I would have done this with my five other children. All right? So let's begin with the feeling that every parent will rise to the challenge. 
and we need, especially us, early childhood educators, we have the means and ways to support these parents. I urge you sincerely that we can do our part. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you for sharing that uh, experience and insight. Maybe we have time for one more question from the floor. Anybody has an early question? Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say um, it's really a real pleasure to be with you and to be in Singapore this week. You have a, a, an important road you're starting on and you have really good leadership who is thinking big and I really hope that you will that you will be inspired as you go along for those of you who are participating in this and those of you who are simply watching it. Uh, and uh, the good thing is, the good thing we know is that this program works if you can get it in place. So the big job now is to get it in place, to get the resources, to get the uh, determination to do it, and to do it broadly for the kids to meet it. So thank you and congratulations on what you're doing. Uh, yeah, thank you to Prof. Bali. Uh, uh, Prof. Before you go there, uh, we like, we now like to invite uh, Prof. Chia Hongman, uh, the Dean of the SR Northern School of Human Development and uh, SUSS on stage to develop to develop token of appreciation for Prof. Bali. First of all, thank you so much for being here today to share your work with us. I, I did some homework, I regret I didn't come earlier because of some prior uh, arrangement. Uh, and what I was really most impressed is not so much the results, but your own personal commitment to the course. I think that was truly important. resonate very strongly with the ethos of the school, the SR Nagel School of Development. Uh, our vision is transforming lives, serving society. It's about being able to be in a position to serve society, uh, you know, in, in a sense, society that needs our help. And among us to get, uh, today, I think, uh, fellow educators, I hope that today you, you bring back with you a, a greater sense of mission and, and commitment. Uh, literally, the future of our nation is in your hands. Uh, there could be a, a, a great leader among you, a, a great pianist or, or a rocket scientist. So please uh, be gentle and engage them well. And with that, uh, thank you so much for being here. For the last activity of the day, we just want to invite um, Kimberly, Yaoqi, uh, A.P. Chan uh, on stage for a group photo. Thank you.